Uh, Rob Paulson, of course, is Yaffa Warner, Pinky, and Dr. Otto Scratch and Sniff. <laughs> he was Raphael in the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, and currently Donatello in the 2000s. Well, not, maybe not currently, but Donatello in the 2000s. Uh, Gray Fox and Metal Gear Solid and Super Smash Brothers. Uh, Carl Weezer from Jimmy Neutron. Uh, the Mask slash Stanley of Kiss from Ace Aventura, the animated series. Arthur from The Tick. Throttle from Biker Mice from Mars. Uh, PJ from Goof Troop. Uh, Dog the Turtle, Axel, Daniel Platypus, Didgeridingo, and Francis X. Bushlet from Tasmania. And Furball and Foulmouth from Tiny Toon Adventures. And a whole list of others. <laughs> And uh, Maurice LaMarche, The Brain, uh, Squid and God Pigeon from Animaniacs, The Father from Codename Kids Next Door, Mr. Freeze from Batman Games, Arkham Origins and Arkham City, yep. <laughs> Dr. Doom in The Adventures Assemble, Balto in Balto Movies 2 and 3, uh, Kiff, Croker, Morbo, Lur, Calculon, etc. from Futurama, uh, Egon Spangler from The Real Ghostbusters, uh, Chief Quimby from Inspector Gadget, George Wilson slash Henry Mitchell and Ruff and Dennis the Menace. Alec Baldwin and Team America World Police. Yosemite <laughs> 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 Sam and some of the Looney Tunes. Uh, Dizzy Devil and Tiny Tunes Specials. Toucan Sam from Fruit Loops commercials. <laughs> the King from Frozen and Mr. Big from Zootopia. And for anime fans, he's the narrator of Tom Poco. So, a little bit of, yeah, that's a big celebrity in there. A little nervous here. <laughs> so, do you guys have lots of questions for them? Yes. Yes. Can you like raise your hand if you have a question? Just one. Okay. Good, good. So yeah, once they arrive and we introduce them, we're gonna again have you guys just wander over to the microphone here. And again, if you could just be as succinct as possible into the microphone, that would be great. Again, they should be here any moment. I think they're just um, probably because. Of, yeah. It could. Be, you've seen the halls down there too, so they're probably just on their way up. But thank you for your patience, you guys. Thank you. 
Thanks, guys. Um, what you folks may or may not know is 
uh, if you if you watch Mrs. Doubtfire, um, that's not how how cartoons are are produced at, at original shows. We can sometimes go back and you know do animate dubbing and that type of thing, but. Um, when we record something like that song, we have generally a piano um, track in our headphones and the lyrics in front of us. And if you read the music, I, which I do, I have the music in front of me. And then we are... And you've got the music in you. I do. <laughs> I ain't got no trouble in my life. No foolish dreams to me. That's how old I am. I'm quoting Kiki D. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, oh, so we had the people together singing the Animaniacs theme song. And as I recall, it was... Jess and myself, probably Tress, and then maybe some studio background singers, so maybe half a dozen people, um, and we record it to, you know, you, we wouldn't hear anything except for our headphones. If you were watching us, you just hear people going like this, and then they would say, it's time for anime, and that's all you would hear is us singing to what we're listening to. Then, it is set off to be animated, and it takes probably about a year, but my part of it took couple hours. <laughs> Which is the best part, because I... It goes, it goes really into Richard Stone orchestrations. Yes, Richard Stone orchestrations, Tom yeah. Hoover, uh, I think Sherry Stoner wrote the lyrics. Yeah. But Richard Stone was the gentleman behind all of the music on Animaniacs, Pinky the Brain, Freakazoid, um, Shirley Walker did Batman. Mind you, in those days, in our case, as a result of Steven Spielberg, we were able to have 40-piece orchestras for every half hour, which is... And we recorded the music in the very same studio that Carl Stalling yeah. recorded the 1940s and 50s Warner Brothers cartoons. All the so, and the same we, piano. The same piano, exactly. And so when you're in that room, you're literally in a cartoon. It yeah. sounds exactly the same. And every room has its own unique resonance. So we, we got to go to sessions. I, I went to a couple of scoring sessions. like, this sounds exactly <laughs> like the Warner Brothers cartoon in the year, you know, in a way that it, even as brilliant as the show as Bugs Bunny on Broadway or Bugs Bunny uh, at the Bowl yeah. uh, is when, when, when they tour it, you lose something because you're not in that, that same residence. Right. It's, oh, it's just the room is about as big as this, maybe yeah. a little bigger, yeah. and everything that you see on the screen uh, in a show like Lily Tunes or Animaniacs or something in which live musicians, as opposed to the dead ones. <laughs> but there's something about live, and they're all world-class players. You guys have a wonderful symphony here in Vancouver. These people, yeah. when you make a living as an oboist, you are a badass oboist. <laughs> um, and they're all in L.A. And so, I mean, we've got many in L.A. So, everything you see, if there's a tight shot of the brain raising his eyebrow and the violin goes, mm -hmm. That's scored. That's there's a. It's on the music. Yeah. So if the tempo is like this, it's bum 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 bum. It's all written and in tempo, and nobody hears it until the conductor lowers his baton. That's the first time anybody hears the music, and these players don't get it beforehand. They come and say so. This every. Yeah, the Lexus is not driving so well, and yeah, I'm not so right. sure about the guy that does the voiceovers for yeah. Lexus. Oh, no, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Neither was Lexus, that's why I lost my gig this year. What was the voice of Lexus for eight S years? Seven and a half. But then the, the baton comes down, and they go, okay. And then, and it's just, it is mind-blowing to watch people at that level do that gig. Yeah. It's incredible. So thank you for asking, Francis. Take care. One more thing. Uh -oh. Gee, Brian, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Francis. <laughs> Ditch Pinky and then try to take <laughs> over. Hey, That's why he gets the big dog. <laughs> hey, man, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Hi. Um, thank you, by the way, for your cover too. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Um, I just want to have a question, I guess, with so many TV shows coming back for reprisals, uh, if there was one role that you guys could reprise, what would that be? No. I think Sticky in the Stain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to see the show or come back in the form of a, of a weekly series or, yeah. or uh, downloadable content or, or even a feature film would be another question. Although, I think of the feature film they would probably cast celebrities and you know be Check like, this out. This Peter is Peter Dinklage is the brain and <laughs> Russell 
Russell Brand is pinky, you know, <laughs> motion capture suits. How the hell did that eat? Fall, sorry. I forgot to say cartoons. <laughs> sorry, I'm channeling Joan Rivers at the moment. Yeah, there's, I mean, there are rumors swirling about on the on the internet about a reboot and all that. I, there's nothing official that's uh, happened, but there's also been no official denials. Would so you guys like to see a reboot of Anime? <laughs> Would you like to see it with other actors than us? No! Thank you. Thank you. Send that to the oh, president of Warner Brothers Animation. Exactly. The, you guys may have seen in May, at the end of May this year, there was a thing on, that was all over the internet, uh, that was, I believe, pretty clearly leaked maybe by Hamlin or something, about Steven Spielberg is contemplating an Animaniacs reboot. Um, and like most said, uh, there has been no official word, and uh, none of um, we certainly don't get that information because we're just actors. Um, but as Mo also alluded to, there's been no strong pushback, and I do know from you know that nothing gets out there with Mr. Spielberg's name on it. And, and if it is not correct, immediately it will be addressed. So I would think that there's a good chance they're, they're at least thinking about it. And, Fortunately, we can still do it again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks for asking, man. Take care. Hey, buddy. <clears throat> hey, happy to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Here. First off, Rob, are you pondering what I am pondering? I think so. What was your first name again? Brad. I think so, Brad. But, um, but yeah, let's see. I think so, Brad. But if we didn't have ears, we'd look like weasels. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, thank you so much for the childhood memories. Thank you. And if I could address the brain, I would say that he's a thousand times better than the leaders we currently have. Don't you think that's true? <laughs> How do you know the leaders we currently have are part of my plan? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Find you more representative. I find the current leaders we have now are misrepresenting of your aspirations in world domination. Yes. Thank you. North. Thank you. North to you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I have a question for both of you. Like one each. For Rob, mm -hmm. who could out um, Groucho Marx like each other? Yakko or Bugs Bunny? Ah, oh, who could? Uh, well, let's see. Mel is dead. <laughs> I win by default. And so is so Groucho, by the way. <laughs> so Groucho, that you, uh, you know, that's a great question. I, uh, that's one of those, uh, between Batman and Superman, who would have Look, <clears throat> uh, I was inspired, as were Mo and our, our, um, our other really gifted actors who are fortunate to do what we do. I was inspired by Mr. Blank. And, you, when you mentioned Bugs Bunny, I'm glad you did, because Phil Lamar, who is just a wonderful actor, and is uh, a, a good friend of both of ours, but when I was uh, interviewing Phil on my podcast a couple years ago, it was just an audio podcast, you know, we talk often about our favorite actors and our favorite um, inspirational folks, and he said pretty clearly, one of my favorite actors is Bugs Bunny. I mean, obviously he knew what he was saying, but, he, but he, because his point was, it was so beautifully executed, from Chuck Jones and the music of Carl Stalling and Mel Blanc's voice. And when that happens, it is utterly organic and beautiful and, and, it is, and it's as, as uh, entertaining and relevant now as it was when they were made in the 40s. Uh, so <clears throat> the short answer to your question is, I have no idea. <laughs> but I love trying to find out. <laughs> so thank you for asking. Now you can ask Mr. LaMarche how much money he makes. <laughs> Now, I have a question for Calculon. Hey. <laughs> Any future Rama fans out there? Well, I'm sorry, this is a pinky in the brain panel. Yeah. <laughs> now, Calculon, being here at this convention, how does it feel to be uh, surrounded by these actors? <laughs> Well, let me tell you that none of them are possessed by unholy acting talent, <laughs> as I am. That was some free acting for you. <laughs> oh, well, you have to sit through a tampon commercial for acting. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an extra go-to ten line, or do you have another line? 
There, I just crouch over. Even more free acting. And writing. This is how work is. It ain't fair, because we spend a good deal of our time laughing. It's like, it's like being around the water cooler, but we're getting paid. That's so awesome. This guy. Uh, look at you, you, oh my goodness. Yeah. Hello. Hello, hi. hi. Uh, I love both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I love both of us. Mel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mel. Good to see you again. Yes. Thank you, sweetie. Um, yes, hello. So I have a question, one quick question for each of you. Uh, feel free to tell me to go to hell because I don't want to put you on the spot for this. Listen, I'm going to go to hell and hell. Sounds like a great title for a, for a cartoon series. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, okay, so I saw you tweet a beautiful, or I think you retweeted a beautiful post on Twitter about Carl Sagan Day the other day. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering who's one of my personal heroes, as is the book of you. Um, have you ever done a Carl Sagan impersonation? I, feel like I did, actually. You know what? I did, I did um, um, Dawes <laughs> Butler. Sorry, my memory oh, is just, I couldn't think of Dawes Butler's uh, name. But I could think of yours. Interesting. So anyway, <laughs> Dawes, I did Dawes Butler's last Captain Crunch commercial. Did you really? Yeah. And he was great. He was great. You know, sweet man. Dawes used to do, like, he used to give voice, voice, voice acting, uh, you know, workouts in his home studio. But for those who don't know, great person. Dawes was. Yeah. Tell the people. Oh, I'm know. sorry. Dawes Butler was Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, Bear. Um, uh, uh, Quick Draw McGraw, Quick Draw McGraw, Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch. Yeah. I mean, he was part of, he was part of, um, he was part of Stan Freeburg. Was he Jetson, too? I, no. Oh, I think Messick was, Messick was all right. But Thank Dawes you. was part of Stan, Fee Stan Freeburg's comedy troupe. He was brilliant. And he used to, he used to do voiceover workouts. And he charged you five bucks. Five bucks to go to his garage and, and just, you know, just spritz with him and put it on tape. Nancy Carbide and Corey Burton got stuff. And, and, and Rick Burson. And, um, you know, just great. Uh, anyway, so... Dawes did the same for me. Like I learned more in that time doing doing my, that Captain Crunch commercial, where he, he talked about like the chest and like you know you gotta really uh, expand your chest out for Yogi Bear. Uh, I don't know, boo boo. Uh, and he said, but you know Captain Crunch is sort of here, and he was my I used to do him as a country club, you know, one of those country club idiots that uh, has more money than brains, you know. And and, and I was like, wow, I mean, with Captain Friggin' Crunch. And the other guy, the other guy in the commercial was a, it was Dr. Carl Saso. And he talked about billions and billions of crunchy stars. So it was it was really cool to work with him. Yeah, that's that's my that's the one time I got, I got paid to do Carl Sagan. And I had to learn it like overnight, you know. But it turned me on to Carl Sagan. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. Uh, quick question. So you've probably been asked this a thousand times. Sorry. Um, so the Nations of the World, was that sped up near the end? Or did you no. Know that uh, well, wait a minute. I think the tempo speeds up. Yeah. Like, it goes up a half step. Every every verse goes up a half step. And then the last verse is, the tempo does pick up. And when Randy and I do it live, it's great. Because Randy wrote who wrote that in many of the songs, like... Uh, it's a great big universe, and we're all really puny. We're just tiny little specks about the size of Mickey Rooney. You might think that you're essential, try and consequential. It's a big universe, and you're not. <laughs> but, uh, we don't know, thank, you. Uh, Randy, thank you. Randy wrote all that stuff, and, I, and we do it live. They go, oh, we're running out of time. But I believe in the cartoon, it, uh, the tempo does speed up a bit. Um, but I have to say, having when you don't see it for a while, and then you go back to it, and I, I can uh, totally see the genius of what Tom Ruger and Steven Spielberg and those folks did, because their uh, their desire was to make their Looney Tunes, their rocking moment, the show that would be utterly entertaining and relevant years later, and and here we are, and the it's been an unqualified success on Netflix, um, at least in the states. And um, we haven't done a new one in 20 odd years. So the, what I'm alluding to is that you, I look back at it and I see Yakko's world, which I think was in the second episode of Animaniacs. And it is a brilliant cartoon. That little two and a half minutes or whatever it is, that is gonna be right out there with uh, 
Hello, my baby. Hello. <laughs> it is. It just is. And, and, and it's not false modesty. I'm good at my job, but the trick is writing the song. That's the tough part. Um, and so I'm just grateful to be part of it because it is, it is a, um, a seminal piece of, of pop culture art. It's really good. It's clever. It's witty. It's uh, unique. And it looks great. And it's free. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, take care. Hey, dude. Hi. I mean, you met you both uh, yesterday. You did. You impressed yes. us both. We, we, you are the very walking definition of precocious, which is a good thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it was great meeting you both, and I Pleasure. really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Um, I was just wondering, when you audition for a character in a cartoon, and you have to create a voice for that character, do you draw more inspiration from, from looking at a sketch or a picture, or, or do you draw more from actually hearing about it and getting directions from the description of that character? Well, um, for, for me, uh, the, the voice itself can come more from, I think, the, if, I've give, if I've given a visual representation, well, a model sheet, as it were, uh, a lot of the, the, the actual voice print of a sound can come from that. What does it look like? What size is it? Um, you know, uh, I kind of crawl up inside of him like a costume. As it were. The brain to me was Orson Welles from the beginning, even though they did not have Orson Welles in mind when they wrote when they drew him. He was based on Tom Newton, a writer at Warner Brothers Animation. As his Pinky is based on Eddie Fitzgerald, and they were like they were buddies. They were a team. They were both writers, and neither of them sounds like Pinky or the Brain. Uh, uh, Eddie's just known for like when he pitches a story, he gets very excited and provides his own sound effects. So he will say things like, "Okay, so then, so then Brain pops in, and his head just pops out like point like that." And then, uh, so, and they made that, that 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 became part of Pinky's dialogue. Brain was and Tom was at Tom Tom speaks in the monotone. He's a particularly brilliant guy. He's got a lot of facts and figures in the back of his head. But uh, if I had done the brain like this, I'd end up doing this whole show. <laughs> but I looked at that that, that furrowed brow and that and those jowls, and I immediately thought of the of Orson Welles. And, 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 and he played a villain in the 1967 version of Casino Royale, and I just thought, you know, he was the best part of that movie, actually. Uh, <laughs> And I just that, thought, me, allow me to inter intercede for just a moment here. That I don't know what your religious. Would you keep, would you keep doing that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what your necessarily religious leanings are, one way or the other. But I'm ready to throw religion out the window. Yeah. Yeah. If there's a if there's a, a cause for divine intervention, that's one of those where you go, oh my god, because the story that has been confirmed is that once Mo, Mo started doing that, they essentially canceled the rest of the auditions because Mo started for the brain. Yeah. Or Dre Romano told me they cast me on the spot, first audition of the day, and that was it. So uh, the answer to that, to that part of the question, in terms of the voice print, yes, the dialogue though informs me what he wants, and that's the next most important thing. In fact, it's maybe even more important than the voice. Always in acting and in writing, the most important thing is to figure out what is your character's desire, what is he fighting for, what does he want, and. That was supplied in the dialogue. He wants nothing less than world domination. So, again, I, Wells was perfect for that. He's a frustrated genius, because we know Brain never succeeds. Yeah, he's a frustrated genius who never quite gets, his, quite gets his due. That's who he was in real life. And and yet, he has sort of megalomaniacal tendencies. Indeed, he was a control freak. And so, Wells just fit perfectly into the Brain's mold, as it were. So it's a little bit of both. And today, I find, I don't know about you, but I am rarely getting artwork when I audition for a character yeah, anymore. Not very once, in a, once in a great while. So, you know, the dialogue definitely helps and, and the through line of the character. And, and the scripts were just remarkable on, on that particular show. And they are often, but Pinky the Brain and Animaniacs, pretty smart. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm not going to waste everybody's time. I, pretty much the same. That's awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Really okay, thank you, man. Good luck to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One's a large one and one's a small one. The small one, do you want that first? Well, the large one is probably going to take up the most space. So yeah, it's poorly. So, really. so uh, how did you get so much adult innuendo into the cartoon show, even with the writing staff? Like, how did it get past the censors? You mean like fingerprints? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, do you, want to, do you want to do one of that question first? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it was um, a question of, like Mo said earlier at the beginning, is you throw a lot of it against the wall. And, 
we know that certain things aren't going to make it. And I recall vividly reading that particular passage between, you know, fingerprints and, and all of that. And I thought, I looked at Tress and I said, there's no, you know, what in way that we're going to get this. Through. There's no way. It's not going to happen. And I'll be damned. You know. <laughs> and what's interesting, uh, there were many that did not. And they tried to push the envelope. There were also things that Mr. Spielberg would listen to and look at and say, nah, you know, we don't want that to be misinterpreted as mean-spirited. Randy wrote a song about Newt Gingrich um, that was supposed to be a la Judy Garland writing a song to Dear Mr. Gable. And she ultimately was saying, you made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to. It's a great song. But anyway, Randy wrote a song where Dot is writing to Dear Mr. Gable and essentially cutting his legs out politically. And Mr. Spielberg, who is decidedly not a conservative, from what I understand politically, said, nah, let's, let's not do that, because it wasn't about trying to go after somebody, you know? And, and I, I have a great deal of respect for that. Um, so yeah, we, made fun of, we made fun of the Clintons a lot on, on both <laughs> Animaniacs. <laughs> but it was always good nature. We made fun of, you know, Bill's tendency to be a little bit... Uh, you know, she'd always be in search of food. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, man, it's so hard to run because I, I can't keep a cigarette lit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it was just kind of you know, a bit controlling. And, Come here, pal. Yeah. But you know, we never made any big yeah. political statements about anybody's competency or anything like that. We just right, it was not. They always buried in character. You know. Uh, so they did try all this stuff. A lot of it did get through. Like, yeah, go. Can you conjugate? I can't even kiss the girl. <laughs> Kenny Mars came and played uh, Beethoven, and he said, I'm a penis. <laughs> what? <laughs> Good night, everybody. No. <laughs> it was all great. And then you, and you got to be uh, Kirk Douglas in the, uh, when we were like, we like painting naked people. That's right. Kirk Douglas, ceiling. What have you done, my beautiful ceiling? <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that. I love that. Or, or, or the reference to the to the uh, somehow joining the Donner Party is not <laughs> like that's Hey Brian, they're having the Donner Party having the Donner's having a Christmas party. Yeah. yeah. Somehow joining the Donner Party is not terribly appealing. To yeah. <laughs> that's a reference to uh, an expedition that went up into what the Himalayas? No, no, in the uh, Rockies. In the Rockies. Uh, and they had to or Northern California. They resort to cannibalism <laughs> to survive. Yeah, so. they eat each other up. So. Um, Sonny, what's your small question? Uh, I actually... That was the small question. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite one of those innuendos is uh, the Inkblot test episode. Oh, yeah. The Rorschach test? Yeah. Girls. Girls. You're the most showy, sexy pictures of ladies. That's right. And the short one is, whose idea was to come up with a uh, Waco Yorn? I'm having a hard time pronouncing his name, sorry. That's okay. I'm excited, sorry. Uh, uh, to say after innuendo, that's all. Uh, huh. Sorry, good, good night, everybody. Sorry. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Uh, Who's that, that? Um, I, I don't know. I think it was probably Sherry Stoner or Peter Tom Ruger, maybe, because that was their. Uh, I, I, I sort of nod to Groucho Marx, kind of like raising his eyebrow, going, "That's the funny, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard." You know, get that, everybody, and um, and it's worked. I mean, remember, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the whole edict from the beginning from the folks who were putting up the do re mi was to not condescend to the audience. They they did not expect everybody to get the joke. Sometimes it was because they were too young. But that's the magic of that show. Now you watch, I don't even know how many people have come up to me in my career and said, I am 34 years old and I'm watching Animaniacs with 34-year-old eyeballs. Now I get it. <laughs> but they loved it as a kid because, you know, the baloney a la Barney would get squished with a giant anvil. That's just like Bugs and Daffy and Tweety. It's not like it's a mystery. Uh, but to do it correctly, and to have the money to do it correctly doesn't happen this day and age without a Mr. Spielberg around the show. It's just it's very expensive. But thank you for noticing all that stuff. And one statement to you guys. What you should do is what they did with the Deadpool uh, test footage and all that. Just get your fans and just tell them, swarm this uh, network and tell them, make the show. Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> you guys all have passports? <laughs> <laughs> and say, basically, we, if you want the show, we can remake great. it. Just, Warm the network. Great. Well, we're, we have lots of extra tiki torches at our local hardware store. Uh, except, uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you, you likes.
then send them out to the internet and just give them to the fans. You do, you animate this for you guys. There you go, yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, love you guys. Thank you for the memories and the voice work. Thank uh, you. I have two questions for Maurice. Uh, what's sort of the Orson Welles impressions? Because obviously Orson Welles is the brain, but obviously he also did them in uh, all these spans of uh, other shows and movies and things. So what's the question about Orson? Uh, just what started the impressions for you? Oh, what started? Um, for me, it was uh, being given a, a tape of a series of outtakes from a, a, a British uh, frozen foods commercial that Orson had gone all the way over to England to record. And the, the, he, the, the directors nitpick and micromanage his every syllable, and so he kind of pushes back against it. And I heard that, and it was the first time I ever heard the sort of celebrities in the act of being themselves kind of a thing. And I just was fascinated by it. Fascinated by Orson Welles, the, the, the director of Citizen Kane, being reduced to going, give me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down on it. <laughs> 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 Forgive me not saying so, that's just stupid. You know, I, just, I, I like played it over it's and over so again in my car. Yeah. And there's so much car time in Los Angeles that <laughs> I really just put it between my ears and lived there. And then and it became a question of like, how do I get my voice to get that, that kind of resonance? So I began to put on weight. <laughs> <laughs> now that's commitment. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I, just, I just sort of stretched my voice into that, you know, because it's all about vocal tensions and just trying different things and lowering and raising and pushing back. And, uh, you know, it just came about. You know, I just loved the music of Orson's voice. And uh, I've been fascinated with it since I'd seen the 1967 Casino Royale as a little yeah. kid. But I finally grew into the voice. But remember also, Maurice, before Pinky the Brain was a really successful stand-up slash impressionist, traveling all over the United States, yeah, all over the place, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so he already has a world-class ear. And uh, matter of fact, we had Carrie Ellis on my uh, yeah. show the other day, which has yet to air. And Mo came out because we're all very good friends and immediately started doing um, Peter Falk from, uh, from, the, from, the, from Princess Bride. As you wish. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. And he's been able to do this. So, Mo, that's, Orson is one of a jillion uh, yeah. impressions he does. I'm no Ross Mark one, but I'm, I'm okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm okay. Obviously Orson actually, he's famous. brilliant, by the way. Obviously, Orson is the famous one because he connected to the brand and obviously just took off from there, so. Yeah. And my last question is for Heaton is about to see if he's here. <laughs> He does Oh, yeah. Miss <laughs> <laughs> but what is your favorite d d delicacy to put on your body? Uh, it's one of six things. Chocolate icing, grapes, gravy, molten boron, children's tears, or popular blood. <laughs> I say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Jockey, that's been the children's tears. <laughs> I just want to say I'm happy that everyone here, the way you weave yourself into the fabric of our lives is just outstanding. Thank you. You, you, can't, you can't shout us out. Yeah. <laughs> We're you, bringing you stuff guys, there. You guys got me through a lot of tough times in my childhood just watching the show. It's amazing. Um, he already touched on what I wanted to do. The reverence of the show was amazing. Growing up as a kid, obviously, like you said, like being, I'm 37. So watching now as a 37 year old, I'm like, holy crap, that's right? amazing, <laughs> you know? And like as a kid, obviously you guys taught me a few things that I wasn't supposed to know yet, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll thank you later. Um, but no, it's amazing. Um, has, there any, has there ever been any characters that, or like anything that's come up against you where you like, you don't know where to go? Like has there ever been an audition where you're just like, you know, because obviously you guys have done so much. Like, is there any time where you know you feel two characters kind of meshing? Oh, like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. okay. Sometimes yeah. that works. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that's your best friend is like cross pollinating two characters. Yeah, yeah I, 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 uh, I had that experience uh, actually on Ninja Turtles because I was Raphael when you were very young, and <laughs> and I just finished up a five year run on the, the latest Turtles. Yeah. And the last episode literally aired today in the U.S. of a five year run, but. <clears throat> Neither voice is particularly different than my own. The challenge for me when they were kind enough to hire me on uh, the latest iteration of Turtles was to 
be good at my job as an actor so that even if people said, wow, that's the guy who's Raphael, but I totally buy him as Donatello. That's my job. My, and, and, that, and this is not meant as a comparison, but that's why we love people like um, uh, Jack Nicholson, who has a very clear sound when he talks. I don't care if it's the Joker or yes. Cinderella Liberty or Finals. Yes. Yes. Right. It's part of what we love about him as a movie star, but you buy him as R.P. McMurphy differently than you buy him as the guy from The Postman Always Rings Twice, because he's a good actor. I should be good at my job. I've been doing it for almost 40 years. But, <clears throat> so my voice doesn't have to change for my ability to inhabit a character. And uh, nobody is limitless um, in terms of what they can create uh, vocally. There are certain things that I just can't physically do that Maurice, Dee Bradley Baker, and Frank Welker do all the time. I, I can't do it. So I try to stretch myself and learn new things, and, but, but ultimately, if I'm doing my job, whether or not my voice has changed a lot, I should be able to address the character and, and as he is, or even her, uh, um, truth and, and experience. That's my job. But thank you for asking. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay, buddy. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just bring it up really, really quick, okay, guys. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll just cut the line off with the last gentleman over there. Great. Uh, okay, then I will. I'll keep ram quick rambling. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hi. How are you? Fine, thank you. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in addition to Ninja Turtles, actually, question for you, Rob. Um, you mentioned your directing, uh, voice directing. Comments. Yes, I am. And, or, uh, I am. I was. They were kind enough to uh, offer me the job of directing the uh, voice cast on the iteration of Turtles, which will be coming a year from now. Yeah. How do you find the process of voice directing compared to voice acting, which you're obviously so? Well, I'm much better at the former. I mean, the latter. Um, I, I'm. I mind you, I've had the great good fortune to learn at the feet of the masters, Andrea Romano, Gordon Hunt. Um, you know, it's pretty difficult, Jimmy McSwain, it's pretty difficult to, to I've, I've learned a lot. Um, but I like it much more than I thought I would. I was very flattered that Nickelodeon offered me the gig, and I said, of course, I've learned clearly in my lifetime to never say no, never, in terms of what I want to do for performing. Obviously, you say no to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's like it. Unless it's like it, in which case. No. <laughs> so, um, no, I, so I said, sure, I'd love to try it. There was a very clear uh, um, rule laid down. It was by me. I said, look, let's do this for five or six episodes and then revisit it. Because I don't want to, I don't want you guys to be in a position where you go, no, this company did a very good job. I don't want to tell, tell me, you know? Um, and the same with me, but I had a ball. They seem to be getting what they want. And ultimately, it's up to the fans. It will be a 2D version, very similar to the original, four new turtles. Um, are, do you want to be Vampire Diaries fans out there at all? No. Oh, well, that was <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the girl who plays one of the characters, Cat Graham, is now April O'Neil. Um, and the two, the four boys they have playing the turtles are excellent, excellent. So I'm very grateful. Maurice and I have already gotten to do a couple of secondary characters on the show. Um, but it is an absolute blast. And so ultimately, the proof is in the pudding. It's a very high bar. If you like it, we'll do another season. If not, we won't. It's that simple, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you, very Thank much. you sweetie. Thanks. Take care. <clears throat> hey, man, it's Wolverine. Yeah, yes, yes, it is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, by way of Kermit the Frog. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, my question is kind of related to one or two of the previous ones. Um, how long does it take to get into a character? Like, what sort of process do you I would say you know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you stepped in the line, apparently. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's not, to me, it's not this big mysterious thing where I need to go off in a corner. In fact, a lot of our work is about improv and thinking on your feet, and they'll throw more recent character and say, hey, we've got this uh, talking chicken here who's uh, got it. We kind of would like to do is, you know, it might be kind of a Rodney Danger feel. And he goes, okay, boom. All right, yeah. Pacock, Pacock. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, nice feet, baby. Okay, all right. Well, yeah. <laughs> what attractive little pack that you are. <laughs> uh, sorry, I meant that literally. Like, oh, God, you people are so nasty. <laughs> 
No, so for me, so what are you? you I told you the Rodney Dangerfield bathrobe story, right? No. 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 Absolute inability to keep his bathrobe shut. I mean, <laughs> the man was a walking terry cloth repellent. I toured with Rodney Dangerfield for, for a year and a half, and he would always wear his robe in his dressing room, and, and it would just come open in the morning. <laughs> he didn't care. So when you say, Oh, Pecker. <laughs> when you say his brain goes. Pecker. That's what the Pecker And Robin is the same sentence. I have. <laughs> allegations! <laughs> Hashtag allegations! Um, well, do you have key? You know, it doesn't really like the brain. If you just call it up now. I mean, we've done it a million times, but if there's a new character, you get some ideas and a few minutes to work on it, and, and then. It's not like a long, long I generally, tr what, what I do is trust myself yeah. that what's going to come out, come out of my mouth is going to be at least funny. <laughs> and whether it's what they want, yeah. that's up to them. I can't sit there trying to please everyone or figure out what, what the director is asking for unless they're actually saying, we want a Rodney Dangerfield impression here. You know, if they give me any leeway at all, I just open my mouth and whatever comes, I trust that it's going to be good enough to be like one of the better auditions of the day. Whether I get the job, none of my business. My right. job is just bring what I do. And in fact, what I want to do when I audition is just get a laugh out of them because I know they're having a hard day. Yep. This is the toughest thing in the world to cast something. They like want you to be good. Like, and, and they've got seven characters that they've got like, we've got to give them voices. Crap, this is not easy. And they're going to hear a bunch of people that aren't right, and they're going to get discouraged and frustrated. So what I'm trying to do is just at least give them a laugh. Yeah. And uh, you know, if I'm right for the job, they won't forget to call my agent. Mm -hmm. So I never worry about getting a job. What I concern myself with is just going in there and bringing a smile. And it seems to work. I've paid the rent doing voiceovers since 1985. Yeah. So, and also, one more thing. How old is your Cary Grant? Good heavens, what an unusual question that is. <laughs> it's not bad at all, thank you. Good heavens, yes, good heavens. Chris Evans, I love Chris Evans, good heavens. You think you think you think, you know he never said that. Good heavens. I've known this guy 25 freaking years. You've never heard me do Cary Grant, good heavens. Let's do a show where I play Cary Grant and you can play. Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels right. I think we should do a show with Catherine Hepburn and Aubrey Hepburn and Cary Grant walk into a bar. Good heavens! <laughs> Good heavens. I've played both of his opposite both of them. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Daniel. Hi, Dan. Hello, Daniel. So, uh, I got questions for Rob. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you about uh, you being the director on the new Turtles. You don't have to tell me anything. He's a freaking slave oh, well, right. they Ask that. me about it. He's a slave director. I was still wondering what I said, Maurice. I didn't even know it's being directed. I pushed the button when Maurice is on the other side of the glass and I said, uh, Maurice, do you recall the talent you used to have? <laughs> Thank you. Could you maybe use it on the <laughs> Thank you. And then I say, well, what is it you want in your depths? Depths of your ignorance. What is it you want? <laughs> Whatever it is you want, I can't deliver because That's I just don't see it. That's absolutely fine. Uh, so, yeah, so my question is, I wanted to ask for your opinion on what makes a great incarnation of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, I think, um, like I said earlier, it's no secret. In, in, in the Circumstance we have today, uh, and by the way, many of, I've met many lovely, talented folks from your local company here, Bardell Animation, who just kicked the living hell out of that show. It looks so great, and is an, an unqualified success. And I believe that in this case, it's because the people who are making it are about between 30 and 40 years old. So they all grew up watching and being totally enmeshed in the ethos and the... Uh, um, story of Ninja Turtles. They get it, and they are you, they are us, they are part of the fan base. So Kevin Eastman says that this is his favorite version of the show, including the original one, because it, really only he and Peter knew about the, the sort of mythology of the Turtles, but even that kind of grew and spread over the ensuing generation. Mm -hmm. And so now Cyril and Brandon Allman and the people at Bardell and all the scriptwriters are all people who grew up watching Ninja Turtles. So it is... Uh, it's one of those things where the stars came together at the right time. The characters are well executed. You got pretty good actors. I mean, you know, Sean Astin and Greg Sipes and Seth Green and 
Um, Kevin Michael Richardson and, and, and Clancy Brown, Eric Bauza, great actors and wonderful writers, but specifically people who are in charge and have the money to do it are deeply in love with the whole franchise. They really get it. Sirinelli, who is the, exec, the EP on the show, executive producer, his fa he grew up in Philly. His father is from um, his father is from um, Italy, and he had, he grew up owning a pizza bar. So Ciro shows us, you know, drawings he used to make on his father's pizza box covers, perfect Ninja Turtle things he did when he was 11 years old. I mean, it's, it was meant to be, but I think it's a really good iteration. And frankly, the bar that we have now to try to do something as interesting or entertaining or as uh, um, respectful of the franchise is a high bar. So we'll see, but I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the, of the franchise. All right. And uh, is it okay if I hear a argument between Raphael and Donatello? Um, shut up! No! <laughs> 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 In the interest of time. <laughs> hey, man. Hey. Uh, huge fancy guys, uh, first of all. You look pretty normal size, but thank you. <laughs> slapping down my leg day, obviously. Uh, first of all, Rob, uh, I'd just like to say thanks so much for talking to us. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, I add my voice to that. Thank yeah. you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Really. What, what is your name, sir? Uh, Justin. Justin, what Justin is referring to is I'm very fortunate. I have a podcast which is turned into a video podcast now. They're called Talking Tunes. T A L K I N apostrophe T W O N S. It is part of the Nerdist family. And um, it is so much fun. You get people like Maurice LaMarche, John DiMaggio, Andrea Romano, Nancy Cartwright, Nolan North, Troy Baker, all of us. Uh, Carrie Ellis, and we sit down and talk about pretty much everything, but focus primarily on cartoons and animation, the work we've done, and um, it is remarkably entertaining because these people are just the best at what they do in the world. So um, thank you very much for mentioning that. It's a guest. Yeah, it's, it's really great to hear uh, behind the scenes. I yeah. wondered uh, if both of you could uh, relate uh, like your favorite kind of behind the scenes. Do you have a favorite The day that we were recording, uh, You Said a Mouse Flew, oh, uh, which is the tongue twister episode of Pinky and the Brain. Kinky sack. The, 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 the kinky sack. sack. Cut, cut, cut. Sock pluckers. Six, 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 six sheep slitters' sons. Sick. Peggy Babcock. Peggy Babcock. Yeah. <laughs> that episode was so tough to get through. <laughs> They hired a man named John Moshida, who at that time had held the world's record, the Guinness World Record, for fastest talking. And he had, had that Federal Express. He had a Federal Express commercial that was fairly legendary. You can still see it. They still show it on. Yeah. Anytime they make a compilation of the best commercials ever made. And he's just a guy sitting at the desk talking to you super fast. How do you get a package on? He's talking super fast, fat expensive, and, but I mean, everything makes sense because he could enunciate and delineate each word brilliantly, and yet he said it faster than anybody else. So he got to play the boss. He and uh, he was, of course, uh, what's his name? Character again? Pinky, stinky, stinky. And I was the brain. And our plan was to uh, fill uh, the 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 hack and sack, kinky sack. Uh, yeah, first factory to keep to to fill them with helium instead of air, so that they'd be just a little lighter, so that everybody would jump a little higher all at the same time, and the Earth's gravity would be reduced. <laughs> I know, would have worked if it worked for those damn kids. Anyway, um, so the second half of the episode is nothing but tongue twisters. I mean, it was from the second we walk into the factory. As uh, disguising ourselves as, as Japanese businessmen, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all tongue twisters, and I became so frustrated. First of all, John Moshida actually blew more lines than 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 Pinky. You did the best. I mean, you maybe maybe tripped over two lines or three. Um, Thank you, Brad. Yeah, and then Moshida did the next best, and the genius here couldn't get through. <laughs> A single tongue twister, and finally I got so frustrated I left the, I left our recording booth, walked into the control room, 
Gordon Bressack, the writer of the episode, was doubled over with laughter and <laughs> falling apart. I just walked up and I just went, bam! <laughs> right in the, just his shoulder, like Lucy, slugging, slugging Linus. Boom! Then I turned around, walked back to my chair, <laughs> sat down, and then I was able to read it because I discharged all my, my frustration. But, so that was, that was a toughie, but it was fun. And uh, that's my favorite, like, sort yeah, of painting nice. the brain story. I have, uh, we all have many, I think it's, having Roddy McDowell as a Snowball, uh, the evil hamster, whatever it was, that was an incredible moment for me and for all of us because Roddy McDowell was Roddy McDowell. He was a Hollywood legend, a living Hollywood movie star. And um, he answered every one of my questions. He was the kindest, sweetest, dearest, most professional fellow. He was suffering from cancer at the time. Early to every episode, uh, answered all my questions about Planet of the Apes and Night Gallery and Elizabeth Taylor. It was just incredible. Um, and then when we had Carrie Elwes and Olivia Hussey. Um, yeah. The, yeah, Olivia Hussey uh, is such an stunningly beautiful she woman. She still looks 20 years old. She's great. And if you guys, she did, she was Julia, and in my mind, the definitive movie about Rome, the, the, um, the one directed by Franco Zeffirelli. 1968. Yeah, and she was like 17 or 18 in the movie. And then she came into work on Pinky and the Brain, and her skin is like alabaster, and I was pretty transfixed. You know? um, but it, it is truly, when you're able to do something like this, and then you get a chance to travel all around the world and, and have these folks like you sit around, take the time to listen to us ramble, it, it is like winning the lottery. It, and now that when we reflect on these stories, it just reinforces how incredibly fortunate we've been. So thanks, Jace. Appreciate yeah. the, uh, the question. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to along because I know that the, the blood is cooling in all of your feet and yeah. you know, the blood clots are oh, so. Oh, yes. yeah, look, it's Harry Potter. Hello. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. I have two questions. First one's for Rob. Yes, sir. I know you played Yakko and Dr. Scratches. Yeah, I did. So um, <laughs> when they're in a comp when they're like in the same scene together, is it difficult like having a conversation with yourself basically? That's a great question. I do all that all the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Generally frowned upon and pleasant company, but you know, without chemical inducement, what am I doing? Um, no, I, it, it is, it is, you know what, it's, I, I hesitate to use the word difficult, my friend, because it's so much fun. Um, difficult is working on a farm. Difficult is pouring hot tar in August, you know? <laughs> difficult is laying sod. I've done it, I know. What I do is, I'm, I choose to be there, and I'm so grateful to be there that it really is about fun and trying to be sort of one up myself. Now if I overlap myself, then I got a problem. See what I say there? I mean think about it. If I overlap myself both of them, how does that happen? <laughs> um, but it is so much fun. And when you're working with people like Maurice and Jess and Tress. I overlap them all the yeah. time. He overlaps and keep while he's talking. We we the bar gets raised higher and higher and really are like a bunch of respectfully folks your age in a giant sandbox in, in Hollywood. It's so it's much fun. fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I have, I have them say, hey, Scratchy, how you doing? I don't just sign yet. Oh, why are you here today? Well, you know, I picked up this girl last night. I'm not like that. I mean, I literally picked her up in my car. Oh, yeah, I just got my driver's like, Really? Yako, how exciting for you. Let me see. You don't so much drive as aim. You know? <laughs> so I can do it, but I've been doing it a long time anyway. But you know what? I started doing and playing like that stuff when I was your age, because yeah. it's fun. It's really all just play. It's really yeah. all just staying open to, to, to whatever comes to you. And, and I think we all start out as improv geniuses, and then that gets too beaten out of us as we go on, but that's what it is. It's yeah, the great playing. thing about being a child is that you're not limited by your childness. You just, everything is exciting, and I never, never, never want to lose the ability to be amazed. I don't. I don't. I, want, I love being surprised. I love being open to, oh my God, that's so cool, you know? Because then I'm going to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and then my second question is, what was your favorite Animaniacs episode to like, be in, probably? Oh, gosh, the next one. <laughs> because it means we got to pick up. Um, I would say for my, my favorite one, uh, honestly, it's difficult to say because we did, I don't know, 100 or whatever, 99 and a half hours. Um, I really like King Yakko, the one where he said, I'm the cousin to the sister of the son, he's his mother of the uncle, blah, 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 bl
he is now repeating, repeat what I just said, repeat what I just said. <laughs> it's very clever. Um, so I like the ones when they're, my favorite ones are the music ones, because I, I was a singer before I, an actor and I love to sing. But thank you for asking, sir. Mine was with Donna Seaman. Yes, where you got I the love to be Kurt Bennett. Kurt Bennett. <laughs> I just love playing that note of being that, that irascible and frustrated curmudgeon. And, uh, you know, for me it was, it was, that was, that was Well, and we also, I remember clearly, happens a lot. Maurice starts doing this thing and I can't get my breath. I, I can't, it's, it, I can't proceed because I'm amazed and laughing at the same time. And it's, it just makes the bar higher and higher and we have it all. Thanks for watching. You're welcome. Hello. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got it. Okay. Uh, okay, Maurice, uh, I'll make it a t uh, two questions. I'll try to do the first one. Uh, as someone who was surprised to know that you that you had a voice role as Mr. Big from Zootopia, do you think this will push for voice actors to get more than just minor roles? Because you and John DiMaggio had somewhat supporting roles in that movie. Well, you know, a push, I wouldn't want to say that, it could, that there's any reason to push. Everybody who's got a SAG card, or a SAG after card now, is, has, is, has got a, a right to be in whatever, you know, Disney's producing or DreamWorks is producing. I don't, I'm not one of those who goes, get those celebrities out of those productions, damn it. I understand the thinking. It's it's there for the for the adults. The kids will go to see the cartoons, and the adults will go to hear their favorite actors as cartoon characters. I understand that. Um, is there any indication that it puts more butts in seats? I don't know. Um, it may or may not. It's none of my business. I'm just I'm happy I get to be a part of of anything that that uh, Rich Moore. Uh, asks me to do. I'm very lucky we worked together on The Critic and on the early days of Futurama, and now that he's director over at Disney, he's just calling me in. So, you know, I'm about to go in and do some work on Record Ralph 2. I don't think I'm breaking any rules by telling you that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm just happy to have the work. I don't, I don't want to be militant and go, no, get those celebrities out of there. They, they do a great job. I thought, I thought uh, Jason did a great job as Nick and Jennifer did a great job as Judy, and uh, I think the film wouldn't have been the film without them. It's all about good acting, right. you know? And uh, voice acting is good acting, but without the hair lighting and makeup. <laughs> so, I don't begrudge anybody a job, I'm just glad to get to play. <laughs> um, okay, also, Mr. Bake, is it, as a, as a Tundra Town crime boss with polar bears, is it okay to uh, somewhat acquire your signature? Is it okay to acquire? Uh, you, want, you want to acquire my signature? Yes. Yeah, sir. come down to my booth. I'll be there after this. And, uh, please come <laughs> down. Yeah, sure. I need to. Uh, I need to. I need to finance something. So we uh, <laughs> make an offer you can't refuse. Thank you for your time. You bet. Thank you, sir. Yeah. By the way, we will. After this, we're going back down to our table. So if you want to come down and say hi in person, you don't have to buy anything. But, uh, you know, come by and say hello and tell us you enjoy Please our Please do. Nice to talk to you. Be here to close it. Look at the, the color of my hair. It's all pink. Like my name. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rocky. Hi, Rocky. Nice You're Rocky, you. I know. <laughs> You're my favorite raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I read uh, on your website that there's a talking about like, what you need to make your competitive advantage and you should be able to fill the voids um, when you are trying to be a voice actor. So what do you think sets you apart from other voice actors, or what do you look for in a voice actor that sets them apart and kind of just makes them so memorable? Uh, well, to the, I can tell you, A, because of my experience, and B, because of my podcast. Um, I, I work with people who are not only the most gifted actors, in my opinion, in Hollywood, and they've proven that decade after decade after decade but they're also the most utterly unpretentious, unaffected, uh, kind, sweet people whom you'd ever need. And most of them are people I have over to my house. I mean, they're people that are my personal friends. Um, and so over and over and over, what continues to shine and what continues to be obvious is that I said a bit earlier, they're utterly unafraid of looking like an idiot or being weird or whatever. That's the whole idea. The idea is not to be encumbered by my robness to get too existential. Um, if that were the case, then I would be 
too afraid to act silly and I wouldn't get jobs. That car weasel leaves completely out to lunch. <laughs> um, and so the same thing happened with Mo, Tress, John DiMaggio, Billy West, Jess Harnell, Frank Welker, people who passed away, uh, Don Messick, Kenny Mo, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, that, that's what I think makes, it makes a good actor, but with respect to voice actors specifically, is that, and, and also Mo alluded to earlier, I'm not a good impressionist. However, when a producer says, you do Don Nacho, I say, well, I do a bad impression of Jeff Bennett's perfect impression of Don Nacho. But if I'm afraid to try it because it's not as good as I think it should be, like Mo said, it's not about me. It's about the producer asking me to play. So I have two choices. Do I jump in the pool and play? Or do I say, I'm not very good. And if I were the producer, I'd say, okay, great. Well, I get somebody who wants to try it, you know? So I try it. It's good enough, but the stuff I add to it, in addition to the bad impression of Don Knotts, turns out to be another character that gets me 12 episodes on another show. So it really is about being fearless, uh, not to the extent that our incredible soldiers and, and first responders out there are real heroes. But in terms of your work, uh, in this case, it's just saying, sure, we'll try anything. And if you don't get the job, it doesn't matter, because they'll remember that you're willing to play. And ultimately, I'm 61 years old. I have the same Jones to do this game that I did when I was the age of Harry Potter who was here. Now, honestly. And this stuff is just gas on the fire and icing on the cake. I love it. So, you don't have anything to say, right, Mom? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good luck to you, Rocky. Thank you for being here. Hi. Hey. Uh, thank you for talking to me on Friday, Rob. Oh, you're it's welcome. So much fun to. You've sobered up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Kidding. Joke. Uh, maybe you haven't, which is yeah. good. And, uh, uh, thank you both so much for you know uh, bringing me up to help me you know get my career as like a compositor for Rick and Morty. Uh, well, good for you, pal. <laughs> Congratulations. So, well done. Yeah. I, I love You're doing that. something you would essentially do for free, right? Almost. <laughs> no, it's great. Honestly, it is, to be able to do something about which you're passionate is like you know, winning the freaking lottery. And not everybody gets to do it. I, and I get that. So, good for you. Yeah, and um, another thing is, um, what advice can you give people like me or you know, anyone? Uh, if they want to try voice acting for the first time. Become a good actor. <laughs> yeah. Because it's more, like it's, 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 we say this like it's a broken record, it's more about the acting than it is about the voice. You know, uh, right now my voice is shot. But, you know, I can say it's nice that I could do you know, a bunch of different impressions, but learning to become, an, you know, learning to, to grow my acting chops is what's, I think, helped me get uh, as much work as I've been lucky to get. Um, you know, it's not about voice acting, it's about voice acting, so, right? Yeah. You know, it's, 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 so study improv, study scene improv, study, huge. scene study, uh, do so sketch, sketch comedy study, we've got, we've got some very good sketch troops up here in Vancouver. Uh, do that type of stuff so that, so that you, you, free, you free yourself up to play. Yeah. You know, it's all just play. It's all just being willing to have fun and to be open and say yes and instead of yeah but, mm -hmm. you know, so that's and, it. Yeah, and improv is solid because it, even if you don't end up, and again, we have to qualify, not everybody's going to want to make a living as an actor. Now, there's a lot of work here in Vancouver. It's highly competitive, and, and so what? I mean, that's the, that's the way it goes. You're going to get some, you're going to not get some. You may get a, make a living, you may not. Probably not. N not because it's personal, but because the odds are relatively astronomical. Um, However, that doesn't mean you stop doing it. It means that you shift your priorities and say, well, I gotta do this to make a living, but my passion and my avocation is performing or acting, whether it's singing in church or doing improv or whatever. Like most said, improv is great for anybody. You never know when the person whom you're working for says, hey man, I'd love to have you go to speak in front of a crowd about what we do and we're, made, we're expanding the business and it needs to be extemporaneous and we'd love for you to be able to take some questions and Oh, by the way, if you could make it funny, that would be great. So, whether you end up making a living as an actor, having that facility and being able to be calm, it just gives you a sense of confidence because you can think on your feet. You know, and it's a great, improv is a blast. 
working in theater is a blast. Um, the tide may be turning a bit because there are many people who want just to do voice acting because of the nature of video games and all that. But I can tell you all the people with whom we all work have a lot of performance backgrounds way before we got into the voice work. And you can do it anyway. There's theater, local theater, local improv. Just get together with friends and mess around. That's another good idea. Yeah. yeah. We got six minutes left, yeah, so sorry. let's power through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Pleasure to meet both of you. Nice to meet you. My pleasure. Thank Can you people guys. tell you you look like Harold Ramis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have had such an incredible career over these 30 years. You've made so many good cartoons you have made that have been part of so many good cartoons. But you've also been part of some bad cartoons. Yeah. We in Canada, we have a career out of making bad cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say? What would you say is the ultimate? What makes a cartoon good or bad? At the end of the day? For me, um, the writing. Mm -hmm. I've been very lucky to be on some, some terrific stuff like The Critic, Futurama, Pinky and the Brain, Animaniacs. And the thing that sets those shows apart is the writing. It's like these are people that should be writing. Feature films. Yeah. It's, 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 just, it's just intelligent. It goes a little bit deeper. I, you know, the, all of these shows have different animated styles, but they've all got something in common in that they're very, very clever. They pay attention to character, the most important thing. Pinky and the Brain isn't about taking over the world, it's about the two characters and their love for each other, the relationship that they have. It's a love hate, it's a it's, it's a love tolerate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and stories, good stories. Those are the things that set it apart. You know, the line drawings are what they, whatever the style of the artist is. You know, yeah, The Simpsons, the the Simpsons, Simpsons is, a brilliant, yeah. is a brilliantly written show, and it's got its own unique style, but it's not like the deepest, most textured animation in the world. So I think it's really about the script. All right, thank you for your time. Back. Thank you, buddy. Hello. Nice to see you again. Monty, right? What? Are you Monty? What were you like? Your, are you, what's your first name? Joelle. Joelle. I was thinking of Monty. Anyway, not, you look like Monty today. Nice to see you. Hi, <laughs> nice to see you too. Um, my question is, um, you talk about how you were both very inspired by Mel Blanc. Um, were you as inspired as his um, actual stage acting with like television, movies, and all that work he's in front of? Radio, the especially. I was. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was, I was astounded to learn. Of course, I was introduced to him first as a cartoon actor, and then when I began to see him show up on the Jack Benny oh, show, yes. you know, it was a station in Jack California, in Toronto, that, that, that aired the old Jack Benny's, and I was like, the guy doing C, so, yeah. Psy. I was like, wow, that sounds <laughs> like... The car starting? Yeah, it sounds just like uh, 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 Speedy Gonzalez, and then I found out, no, that is Speedy Gonzalez. Yeah. And I, then I went, of course, of course he's a brilliant, his timing is great. Look who he's working with. Right. He's working with Jack Benny, who's known to have the most legendary wow. timing in all of comedy. So if you're you know, one of his cohorts of compadres, you've got to be playing at the same level as him. That's what made Mel so fantastic. His comic timing was wow. unbelievable. To me, his, um, what I recognize his name with is the uh, Christmas episode where Jack Benny is shopping and yes. he comes for service. I um, love that. Mm -hmm. I just heard it on the radio because it's Sirius uh, XM, by the way. If you guys listen to Sirius Satellite Radio, they have a thing called Radio Classics, right? And often ja um, Jack Benny and Mel Blanc show up on that. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Really? And and I didn't, of course, I didn't grow up in the days of radio, but my parents, long before Sirius XM, would find cassettes of check this out, man, because I know you did what you do, and you're gonna love this. It was Bugs Bunny, mm -hmm. and from the '30s. Oh my God. Good for you, honey. Yeah. Good for you. Good for I'm sure who's paying attention to that So, like, I'm, I'm not even 21 yet, and I grew up watching Jack Benny. So, no, like, see, that's so great. It's all available now for anybody to see. Stuff that is so inspiring, and it's 70, 60, 70 years old. Yeah. Good for you. You have excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you my dad. Thank my dad for that. Dad, like, mm -hmm. we thank you, dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wherever you are in the universe. You've got a good, you've got a good dad, and you've got a good teacher, and yes. Jack Benny, and all those classic guys. They're the people who pay attention to. Now I don't know what genetically happened with respect to the color of your hair, <laughs> <laughs> but good for you. Wave that freak flag, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck, Steve. Thank you. Hello, Hello. Um, 
thank you so much for chatting with us. This has been absolutely wonderful. Oh, this is an honor. Uh, well, I have a very quick question for each of you, um, for Monsieur Le Marche. Um, when you were doing the voice of the God Pigeon, Oh. Were you saying words? <laughs> First of all, I was not the voice of the God Pigeon. You said at the beginning you were the voice of the God Pigeon. No, no, no. No. Did I? Yes. I think you did. You said squint and the God Pigeon. You said squint and the God Pigeon in addition to the brain. You did Bobby, right? And the I did squint and no, I just did squint. Oh. Oh. Did I say the God Pigeon? What's that? What's I'm a lying going? sack of poop. <laughs> <laughs> if I said that, I'm really sorry. Well, I know, that was Chis Venera, like I was there for the sessions, I can tell you Chis Venera played the God Pigeon. And um, I played Mr. Big in Zootopia, maybe you can play again? I never saw Zootopia. Okay, because I was doing a Godfather impression to that. Uh, Chis Venera, who played uh, 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 Bobby Squid and Pesto. Pesto. Thank you. He, he did the God Pigeon. Now I can tell you he didn't say a friggin' word. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, no, he just, it was just, just gibberish. Just, just Italian, Brooklyn gibberish. That's where Chickie's from, yeah. Um, and so, Rob, yeah. um, my question for you, I, I was wondering if we could get, like, the inside scoop from the horse's mouth about why exactly it is that Yakko and Milton Berle didn't get along. Why? <laughs> Yakko and Milton Berle didn't get along? Yakko and Milton Berle didn't get along. It was just something like that. What's the dirt? Well. Honey, it's, uh, it's one of those, there are a lot of legends about Milton Berle, and <laughs> one of which has to do with stuff that I really shouldn't talk about in Pleasant Company, because I feel like we can record it all over the place. Uh, let's just say that, um, let's just say that Milton wasn't as big as he thought he was. Okay? That's what I thought. No, I'm just kidding. I was a huge fan of Milton Berle. In fact, in fact, my, my sweet mother, I love my mother, I miss her every day, I miss my dad about once every two weeks, and he would get that. Um, I took my mother to lunch at uh, uh, Beverly Boulevard, Beverly, no, Beverly Drive in Hollywood, they okay. uh, for lunch, you know, beautiful deli in Beverly Hills, and Milton Burrow was sitting there. And my mother said, oh my God, from Michigan, oh my God, Rob, is, is, that, is that Milton Burrow? I said, yes, it is, Mom. So we sat kind of close, and I, I said, we want to meet him? And she said, I don't want to bother him. Well, you know, the worst he can say is no, and then he turns out to be a jerk, and now you have a story. <laughs> it was delightful. Doesn't like I said, Mr. Burrow? Yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's my mother, Lee Paulson. We're both big fans. And she said, nice to meet you. Lee stood up, shook with both hands. Just delightful. And my mother went back to Grand Blank, Michigan, floating on air because Uncle Milty had given her, you know, two minutes of his time. So, yeah, I might have a problem with it, but Rob doesn't. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, sweetie. <clears throat> hey, handsome. Um, hello. Um, um, I'm just wondering, what was Brain's favorite plan to take over the world? <laughs> My favorite plan to take over the world was the Christmas plan. Yes, place a noodle noggin doll in each person's home because at the end of the story, not only did he find out that he had a, a dear friend in Pinky, <laughs> only only time that the plan actually worked, and the brain took over the world for exactly twenty seconds. <laughs> what did he do? Because he found the Christmas spirit, he told everyone to have a merry Christmas, a very merry Christmas. And then destroyed the machine. Yeah. So that's my favorite plan. Ah, question. Because it worked. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Great to see you guys. Yeah. Well, we're out of time, and uh... <laughs> he's got a gun. <laughs> he's I know we're all asking. I mean, <laughs> jerks, except for Melvin Murrow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, you guys have talked a little bit about like um, auditions and stuff, so I just wanted to know, is there any famous character or show that you've auditioned for that you did not get the role for? And what was those roles? Uh, yes, so I was uh, one of the last two or three of Philip J. Fry, uh, and I didn't get it, and it's just fine, because they pick absolutely the right guy. Billy is freaking magical. And he, again, is just the nicest, sweetest, 
unassumingest guy and kills it as Philip J. Fry. He is, he's, he's an icon, Billy. He's the real deal. So that's probably the biggest one that I didn't get. Yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. It came so close. Mm -hmm. I would love to have had you on the show. <laughs> well, uh, for me, I, I got very, uh, I got kind of close to playing Joker on one of the iterations, the 2003 oh, one, right. The Batman. And uh, I, I, I really, I really poured all my psychosis into that one. I, I just, if I were a serial killer, uh, you know, serial killing clown, what would I, what would I be like? You know, and I tried to just push all morality out of my brain and just become as, as lecturish as I could. And, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd lay down something really original and kind of, kind of creepy and scary. But, you know, it, it, it ultimately went to Kevin Michael Richardson. He was the right guy for the, the job. But, I would have liked to have taken a crack at it. The Joker. Any chance we could hear that right now? I can't remember what I did. I, just, oh. I, I, I really went into a dark place. <laughs> I could just go in there and do a voice. I walked into the booth and I was like, go to the place where you could actually kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> if you've driven in LA, it's you know exactly what that is. What I did for the calendar man on, uh, on, on the Arkham games oh, yeah. is kind of there, but with more of a sense of humor. But it was that kind of empty, soulless, dark place. Because they said they didn't want a Mark Hamill kind of Joker. They wanted a different kind of Joker. But ultimately, they, they kind of tacked back towards the middle, and uh, maybe what I did was too dark. Okay. Yeah. But that's that's so that's that's the other one. All the rest of I just you know I'm, I'm always in acceptance that uh, I'm playing him a good audition, and that's all. But that was what I really wanted. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? That's the first time you've ever gotten through the line. I'm very happy about that. That's great. Thank you. Nobody's much more disappointed except everybody here. <laughs> your, your patience is so appreciated. Yeah. We are so grateful to have been here with you. Um, oh, Canada, do we love you? Yes. <laughs> So, and Mo is This a, is my home country. Mo is yeah. from, uh, from, 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 from Willowdale. Yeah. Willowdale, yeah. Ontario. Yeah. Right. So, but, uh, yeah, that's the first time, that's the first time you're going to hear Vancouverites clap to the draw. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we are profoundly grateful and understand what an incredible privilege this is to be with you guys. So, thank you for giving us an hour and a half of your time. Yeah. And so, I, uh, I'm contractually bound to finish with the following. So, <laughs> Wait a second. So you're saying, in other words, that you're just very grateful to have yeah, you're done in, now. in the United States. Um, yes, and but Canada? the fact is, that I was I was born in the United States, but I have friends in Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, <laughs> Jamaica, Peru, Republic Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Venezuela, and the and still Guatemala, Bolivia, and Argentina.